get started in just a minute. Um, glad to see everybody here today. I know we're a little slow to join. I know there's been a lot going on this week, but uh, we always have such great content as well as such great participation. So really excited to have everyone here today. Um, I'm Robert Stiles with the Heartland Health Resource Center. Uh, we're really, really happy to see you and uh, really happy that we're able to offer these webinars and continue hopefully to, to provide really detailed specific information that hopefully is very helpful as you uh, implement and continue to offer telehealth services at your uh, clinic or hospital or health system. So I'll just go ahead and uh, introduce Rochelle, who those of you who've been on these sessions all along know her quite well and are just as fond of all the great information she provides us as I am. It's, it's incredibly useful. I did a presentation earlier this week where I uh, stole <laughs> two of her slide decks that she's presented in this. One was on the Medicaid fee schedule um, for 2022 that's coming up and the other was on sort of what are what's going on in the legislature. It didn't seem realistic or needed to uh, write my own when Rochelle has done such an amazing job recently on those two topics and we'll revisit them as well. I know, um, I think we'll all be excited. We'll be having upcoming once they finalize the 2022 fee schedule. Um, a session on that, and that'll be really exciting to see sort of what comes out of that and what next year looks like when it comes to telehealth billing uh, for Medicare. So with that, I'll pass on to Rochelle. We always have a lot to cover, and uh, please go ahead. All right. Thanks, Robert. And you're exactly right. The anticipation is building around September 1st, this time this time of year, excuse me, not September, uh, November 1st, this time of year is when we typically see um, the physician fee schedules come out. So I, I definitely see some telehealth policy, uh, uh, for better, for worse, coming out here in the next couple of weeks. And um, actually, the timing today works really well. Last night, uh, there was a new Medicare telehealth announcement that I want to talk about for just a few minutes today, where a new place of service code is being created that would go into effect January 1st of 2022. And uh, we don't know much about it yet, but I have a couple predictions based on the way it was created, the timing of when it was created, and what we know from the Medicare proposed rule that I anticipate we're going to see this new place of service code uh, come up in the final fee schedule for Medicare um, here in a couple of weeks. So today's session is really focused on telehealth services involving the hospital or healthcare facility setting. So I'm going to start uh, after giving you this breaking news on this new place of service telehealth code, talking about on the hospital side, some of the originating site rules, the pre-COVID, the intra-COVID rules, uh, some of the, the considerations that you have to take into account when providing telehealth service in the hospital facility setting. And then switching gears a little bit to the professional side, but with a focus on the professional services delivered to patients in the hospital facility setting and um, some unique coding rules to think about from their services as well. So I want to start by talking about this new code for just a moment because this just came out last night and you know I love talking about the latest breaking news in telehealth and uh, Medicare announced Medicare is the um, place of service code set keeper. Uh, they create and they maintain the list of the two digit codes that we report on um, the, the CMS 1500 claim form whenever you're using that form for coding and reporting. And it's required by HIPAA and the, the standardized code transaction rules under HIPAA that everybody using electronic claims use this same code set. That's why uh, place of service 11 means office for Medicare and Blue Cross and Aetna Humana, we're all required to use uh, the same standards. So in our place of service coding, we know several years ago, a new place of service code 02 was created to identify a telehealth service. Before that, whenever we were delivering an office visit or other services via telehealth, we would add a modifier, uh, 95 if I remember correctly, to the service to communicate to the payer that that service was done via telehealth. And then there was a change a few years ago, um, I wanna say 17, 18, um, around there, 
creating the place of service 02, where we still report the same procedure code, but place of service 02 did a couple of things. Um, it is connected to a site of service type. What I mean by that is every place of service code is identified as either, either a facility-based place of service or a non-facility setting. And the payment rates for any CPT code or HICS-PICS code can differ depending on whether they're delivered in a facility setting or a non-facility setting. Non-facility settings like the provider office typically have a higher rate of payment because um, they're, the idea is that there's more overhead to the professional because they lease the site or they own, uh, they own the office location and the equipment and the supplies. Whereas the same provider going into a facility setting like a hospital or a nursing facility doesn't have the idea anyway that they, they don't have that same overhead expense for that exact same service. And Medicare implemented a rule that telehealth services for the, the distant site professional would get paid at the lower facility rate. Um, the idea being a patient at another hospital, another provider office, or right now during the public health emergency, maybe at home, um, that distant site professional is not incurring the overhead expenses for the patient at that distant site. And so place of service 02, when it was created, was designated as a facility-based place of service uh, to, to um, classify payment at that lower facility rate on the fee schedule. So since that time, we've used place of, zero to, place of service 02 for all telehealth services until COVID kind of uh, threw that for, for a loop, and we've got some temporary rules that change that. But ignoring, ignoring COVID rules for a moment, this new um, publication yesterday says that there will be a new telehealth place of service code in addition to place of service 02. And what the new code 10 will do is distinguish um, uh, telehealth services to a patient at home from telehealth services to a patient in any other location. So um, I am not a, a gambling person, but I have a couple of predictions on why I think this new place of service code 10 was created. And I think it uh, my, my prediction is that it ties very closely to some of the proposals in the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, if you go back to the session that we did on the proposed rule, um, there, we already on a permanent basis can deliver telehealth services to a patient at home, even outside of the public health emergency, for substance use disorder services or for mental health conditions co occurring with substance use disorder. Then we had a statutory um, expansion of that under the Consolidated Appropriations Act that says, okay, not only do we want to allow those telehealth services to patients at home on a permanent basis for substance use disorder, but for any mental or behavioral health condition, whether or not it co-occurs with a substance use disorder. In that expanded coverage under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, there were some caveats that if we're relying on the Consolidated Appropriations Act to cover a telehealth service to a patient at home, then there has to be an initiating face-to-face non-telehealth visit and then periodic visits afterwards that are in-person face-to-face non-telehealth services. What we saw in the proposed rule uh, back in July was Medicare trying to define how often those in-person te uh, non-telehealth services needed to be in order to deliver telehealth to a patient at home. And the proposal was within six months, within the previous six months of a telehealth visit. Okay, so that's kind of the background or the context. Uh, Medicare was struggling with 
how it would know um, from a claim form perspective and a claims processing perspective when a claim is submitted, whether and when providers had delivered a service that was only covered as a result of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. It's not something that would be covered as a telehealth service, but for those expanded provisions, meaning the patients at home. So I think this new place of service code 10 that would go into effect um, technically January 1st of 2020, or excuse me, that will go into effect uh, January 1st, 2022. I think we're going to see it appear in the final fee schedule when that comes out in a couple of weeks. And I think it's going to be primarily used for these mental behavioral health services delivered via telehealth to a patient at home when the public health emergency ends and the patient's home is no longer an eligible originating site. So more on that to come. Um, the other thing that I think this possibly signals um, is that in the announcement that came out yesterday, while the place of service 10, identifying telehealth to a patient um, in, in a place other than a typical originating site like the patient's home uh, will go into effect January 1st. Medicare contractors are instructed not to use it or require it until April. And that's kind of, that, that, that signaled to me something pretty important. Uh, the requirement to have a face-to-face non-telehealth visit in the preceding six months was a proposal and Medicare wasn't set on that time frame in the proposed rule. But instructing contractors not to enforce this new place of service code for telehealth delivered to a patient at home until April signals to me that Medicare may be finalizing that six month requirement. And here's why. If our final rule comes out November 1st, we have November, December, January, February, March, April. We have six months for face-to-face -face visits to be provided before this new place of service code would be used by contractors to enforce the requirement to have a face-to-face -face visit in the preceding months. Um, so I, I suspect that may signal that that particular requirement may get finalized. Again, just a prediction, I don't know that. We'll, we'll see in the next couple of weeks what Medicare does with that. Um, it also tells me that we may need to be looking for private payer policies um, to adopt possibly this distinction on telehealth to patients at home or not at home and what they may be doing in terms of their coverage policies as the public health emergency winds down. So, and Rochelle, we've got a question yes. in the chat. Yeah, great, so, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Would the six month rule apply where telehealth delivery uh, is happening with patients at a doctor's office? Okay, excellent question. I'm so glad you asked that. And no, the requirement to have an initiating in person non telehealth service and to have those same in person visits within six months of subsequent telehealth services for, for mental health only applies if the only reason we can deliver that telehealth is through the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And what the Consolidated Appropriations Act did is specifically allow the patient's home to be a permanent eligible originating site for those services. So right now, during the public health emergency, home is an eligible originating site anyways. And those initiating visit uh, requirements and six month in-person visit requirements don't apply until after the end of the public health emergency, where we no longer have this kind of temporary flexibility that makes home an eligible originating site for all services. So that, that's an important feature. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too, when we did our session on emergent, emergent goodness, emerging telehealth legislation, say that three times fast, adding the home as an eligible originating site on a permanent basis 
appears in nearly every telehealth bill that's been proposed at, at the federal level. So if at some point between now and when the public health emergency ends, one of those bills were to be passed, making the home an eligible originating site on a permanent basis for all telehealth, this concept of the, the initiating visit being in person and subsequent visits every six months, May not, may not ever manifest as a requirement because we would never have to rely on the, the um, flexibilities under the Consolidated Appropriations Act to deliver those telehealth services. They would be covered outside of the Consolidated Appropri Appropriations Act just as a regular telehealth visit. And so, I wanted to bring up, um, you know, this planning is also dependent on how long the public health emergency lasts. They may be planning for if the public health emergency ends at the end of 2021, but if it extends into 2022, then it's likely, and please tell me if I'm wrong because you're the expert, but it seems to me that it would be likely to not really go into effect until probably at, at, at earliest 2023 if they continue some of the services under the public health emergency to the end of the calendar year, which is what they're often talking about in order to try to give us some stability and understanding, you know, we don't want the public health emergency to end and all of a sudden tomorrow you have to go back to the old way, so. Yeah, you're exactly right. And so this is, this is what the two, um, this is the way place of service code 02 would be modified. This is what new place of service code 10 would look like. But because of this kind of uh, moving target on when the public health emergency ends and the, the possibility or the likelihood that coverage under our existing flexibilities, including the home being an eligible originating site, um, if that were to extend longer, it kind of gives us more time for Congress to take action on one or more of those pieces of telehealth legislation. And if passed, and if it happens to be one that makes home an eligible originating site for all telehealth services, then these face-to-face -face rules that only come into play in this narrow context of the Consolidation Appropriations Act would really never manifest as requirements because they're only there if the service is not otherwise covered as a regular telehealth visit. And I know we need to move on, but we have one last question from Jordana. Bernard yeah, absolutely. Let's, yeah. Hospitals, which is what we're here for today. But actually, we're here for this. This is great news and timely. So that's why people should participate. Um, would the new place of service 10 code for telehealth into the home also be used for ESRD home services or just mental health? So that's a great question. Um, we don't know yet. All we know is exactly what you see on the screen, but it suggests to me that those other services that right now, like, like the certain um, ESRD services that can be provided to patients home already outside of the public health emergency flexibilities, very well could also require place of service 10 to be reported instead of two when we go back to using these normal place of service codes for, for our telehealth. You're exactly right. So all of that is to be determined on the full extent on how that code was used. The timing of its creation, the implementation date in April just kind of triggered to me thoughts of the services under the Consolidated Appropriation Act as potentially the primary intent and reason for creation of that code. But um, exactly as that, that um, uh, attendee suggested, I think it's going to have other uses as well. And certainly um, we'll be interested to see what private payers do with that, um, with that particular place of service code. So uh, jump in with any other questions that come up on that. I know it's a really kind of convoluted uh, concept on when those face-to-face -face requirements apply and when we would use those different place of service codes. And I'll certainly make sure I include the guidance on that that comes out in the final fee schedule when we have that session coming up in November, I believe. So getting into hospital 
facility-based telehealth services and telehealth reporting. I'll start with kind of the easy component of this or easier component maybe. When hospitals are serving as the eligible originating site, so where the patient is located. And um, hospitals are on a permanent basis eligible originating sites where a patient can receive telehealth. We see this most frequently, um, you know, with like a critical access hospital serving as an originating site and the distant site provider, maybe, maybe a provider or a specialist at KU Medical Center. But that doesn't have to be the case. It is a regular, you know, PPS hospital. It can be a critical access hospital um, that can be the eligible originating site. And the hospital serving as the eligible originating site can bill the originating site fee Q3014 and receive payment for that service above and beyond and separate from other payment methods like an APC or critical access hospitals cost-based reimbursement or DRG reimbursement. So this is a separately payable um, fee and service that they could uh, submit for payment. To give you an idea of what that payment amount is, it's not a huge amount, uh, 2702 for 2021, and we'll look to see what, what changes with that payment rate in 2022. Um, there are some uh, medical staffing considerations to think about that are unique to the hospital setting. So with Medicare conditions of participation and um, state law requirements for hospital services, there are rules that provide us seeing patients and taking care of patients in the hospital setting have to be have to have a medic be approved by the medical staff and have to be credentialed and privileged with the hospital's medical staff. So that's kind of a unique consideration in the hospital facility setting. If we think about the critical access hospital or you know the the, the smaller hospital um, utilizing larger hospital distance site professionals to help do telehealth um, for, for specialty services. And how we make sure those distance site professionals at KU still have to have meet certain medical staff credentialing and privileging rules. So a couple of those to think about. Um, the, I've got the citation for Medicare's requirements for medical staff membership and credentialing and privileging under the Medicare conditions of participation. And those require that any hospital that is working with a telehealth provider or a distant site hospital to deliver telehealth has to have a written agreement in place. So that's kind of our first check the box requirement for hospitals that's a little bit unique to other healthcare settings. We've got to have a written agreement. The distance site hospital, um, if it's a hospital, um, has to ensure that the distant site professionals that we're wanting to come in and deliver telehealth um, meet the medical staff standards um, for the Medicare conditions of participation. So any medical staff requirements that Medicare has, that distant site hospital has to uh, represent in this written agreement that their medical staff members, their professionals that are delivering telehealth meet those requirements as well. Now, the, the hospital that is that may be serving as the originating site where the patient is located and getting these telehealth services has a couple of options with respect to the medical staff uh, membership and, and credentialing and privileging of these distant site professionals. The originating site hospital could require that those professionals go through the originating site hospitals, medical staff, application, approval, credentialing, privileging process, just like any other member of the hospital's medical staff. Um, what I often am seeing is a category of medical staff membership in the med staff bylaws and the rules and regulations specific to telehealth. And that telehealth uh, category of medical staff membership, you know, it has different privileges in terms of participating on committees and voting rights in the hospital and things like that, that your normal active medical staff have that you may not want distant site telehealth providers to have. 
Um, however, I, I, I often see in smaller hospitals um, that they don't yet have that category. And so if you're relying on your active medical staff category for distance site professionals, you've got to be aware that those distance site professionals may have all the same rights, voting rights, um, uh, committee participation rights that your normal medical staff have. And you may or may not want that. The other option that the originating hospital has where the patient's located is they can rely on the medical staff application, approval, credentialing, and privileging process of the distance site hospital. And that's an option that I see probably utilized more frequency than the former. Each kind of has its, its pros and cons. Um, relying on the distance site provider, you know, if we're talking about a KU health system, they may have uh, more resources, they may have a more robust process than the originating site hospital. And it kind of alleviates some of that burden on the providers at, at maybe the smaller community hospital. On the other hand, using the, the former process where you uh, have them apply, you go through the process on your own staff and have them um, as maybe telehealth medical staff members within your own hospital gives you a little bit more control over the process and your own knowledge of the due diligence that, that they've undertaken for each of those professionals. So pros and cons, but you've got that option. And we've got um, a question the, in the chat here. Yes, yes. All right. This question this is, is great. From, I love it. From Bob Clemente. So Bob, jump in here if I don't get this quite right. Um, but the question I'm seeing in the chat is, could psychiatric could a psychiatric hospital bill a facility fee for a primary care physician and for the psychiatrist for telemedicine? Can they both be billed on the same day? And then how is it billed? Like what info would you need? So I think, Bob, the question is, can the hospital be both the originating site and bill for essentially the distance site professional who's rendering the telehealth service to a patient in the hospital whose billing rights have been reassigned to the hospital? Um, and the answer is yes. So one, uh, it could depend on whether the provider's services are considered um, provider based as an outpatient department of the hospital that will determine whether you're billing on a UBO4 or the CMS 1500, you know, facility versus professional fee. Okay, can, um, I, uh, can, can I share yeah, this? Go ahead, Bob. Because mm -hmm. this is kind of what's on my mind, okay? Uh, our, uh, in the psych hospitals I'm involved with, we have a primary care physician who's been doing, you know, or, uh, uh, his or her extender, and we have a psychiatrist that are both billing telemedicine during the during the day. Okay, it may be on the same patient, it may not. But what I'm referring to is the facility, meaning the hospital, billing the facility fee. Okay, and uh, and so for example, if a psychiatrist saw a patient and the primary care uh, saw a patient on the same day, they're billing separately through their own billing service, okay? Can our and hospital... separate specialties uh, with, with concurrent yes. care, they likely can do that as different specialties. Okay, I'm following. Okay, then can we bill two facility fees for that day because they're two separate encounters? And, and then the next question I have is, how do we do it? Assuming we're billing Part B, and what do we do if we're billing? Uh, you know, we can't bill Medicaid because we're on a per diem rate. Okay, so they're not allowing us to bill uh, professional fee services, but presumably we could also do that for commercial insurances. In other words, bill commercial insurances besides Medicare for the facility. Am I on the right track? Okay, so I, I think I'm following. Let me ask one follow-up question. When you say can the hospital bill a facility fee, are you referring to the telehealth originating site fee or? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So that's a great question. Let me see if I can find guidance on, on that because I, I, I understand what you're saying. We've got two professionals 
rendering um, telehealth visits. So they're going to have each one of them will have their professional distant site telehealth charge. On the hospital side, it's easy if there's one professional. We know that you can bill the originating site fee Q3014, but if you bill like two units or you bill that exact same code for the same patient on the same day twice, it may look to Medicare like a duplicate claim, right? So you're asking how do you submit those two originating site fees for the two distinct uh, uh, telehealth services? Am I right there? Yes, that's right. Yes, perfect. And that's a great question I hadn't thought about before. Let me research that and see if um, if like a modifier, my, my initial thought is maybe a modifier 59 on the second charge, but I, I don't know the answer to that and I haven't seen guide not, guidance on it. So I'll see if I can find that. Okay, and then as a follow-up to that, how do you bill these things in the first place? The, the physician has already billed, let's say they billed nine or 10 months ago and uh and it's medicare okay? okay what information do we have to have to uh to um uh to bill this and uh and under what you know under you know under what uh uh do what form or what you know what electronically do we do yeah, so uh, for the on the hospital side, on the facility side, it'll be a UBO4 claim, but it's going to Medicare Part B, even if the patient was an inpatient at the time the telehealth services were, were provided, your originating site fee Q3014 gets billed to Medicare Part B, to your Part B contractor. Um, so I, I I think what you're saying, if the provider provide billed for these months ago, you're thinking if the facility has missed the opportunity or had not been reporting the originating site fee previously, what do they do now? What what would they need to report to go back and capture some of those that have already occurred? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Really, we just need to know when those telehealth services were provided um, by the distant site professionals. There needs to be some kind of documentation to show that there was a, 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 an originating site, uh, or I should say a telehealth service provided. You'll need the data service. You'll need the patient. Um, and any other, your, your typical information that would, you would have on the UBO4. Um, the Q3014 reporting is, um, is really pretty straightforward for those UBO4 claim forms. Okay, great. It, yeah. uh, thank you, Rochelle. Yeah. And then, you know, Medicare, you have a one-year look back or a, a one-year timely filing period for Medicare from the date of service. So that's something to keep in mind, but it does give you an opportunity to maybe look back on, on um, how long those services may have been provided that you can catch up on. Perfect. Thanks. You are and welcome. Michelle, while yes. we are on questions, I've got another one for you. All right, let's do it. I love this. All right. Carol asks, if, do non-physician healthcare providers need to be privileged or is it a different process for these professionals like PT, OT, registered dietitians? Yes. Okay. So great question. Um, the It has to follow the uh, whatever the general medical staff application bylaw process is for the facility. So we know that um, physicians on the medical staff have to go through the application credentialing and privileging process. And then we would look to the facilities bylaws for other professionals like PT, OT, speech therapy, psychology, social workers, all of those other disciplines that could be rendering telehealth within the facility and look at what the hospital's credentialing and, and verification processes. Those, in, those disciplines typically do not become members of the medical staff, but they may still have to go through a credentialing process, um, a verification process of licensure and those types of things, and the facilities, bylaws, and rules and regs on when and how and under what circumstances they can provide care to patients in the facility. Great questions. I love it. 
Okay, so I think we've talked about the um, kind of the contracts between an originating site hospital and a distant site hospital if they're collaborating together to provide telehealth services. Um, these requirements, these specific contractual requirements are waived during the public health emergency. Um, so if, you know, March, April, May of last year, things were crazy and we we started these collaborations you got another hospital to help provide telehealth coverage on kind of quick turnaround um, that's okay during the public health emergency but it's probably a good time to revisit those arrangements and make sure that uh, any contractor any telehealth services companies or any distant site hospitals that we have those telehealth arrangements with we're meeting the Medicare conditions of participation for whenever that the public health emergency status goes away, because these requirements likely will go into effect immediately once the public health emergency ends. And I think it's just a good idea to outline who's doing what billing, um, what is the distance site telehealth providers, you know, credentialing license verification process look like so everybody's on the same page. There is a separate section of the Medicare conditions of participation for hospitals that are delivering care to patients as contracted services. So this is already used for um, like emergency physicians, for maybe hospitalists that are um, a contracted group, radiology groups that are contracted versus um, versus employees of the facility. So there are some rules and requirements there. The hospital where the patient is located still is responsible for ensuring that the, pa the care to patients, even if delivered via telehealth by a different professional, are performed in a safe and effective manner. And the hospital still has the requirement to maintain a list of all of their contracted services so when you when and if you get surveyed, you could produce this list to say this is our distant site hospital or this is our teledoc company that we've contracted with to provide services to our patients. Um, another requirement under the Medicare program outside of the public health emergency, not surprisingly, is that those professionals delivering telehealth in the facility setting have to be licensed, and they have to be licensed in the state where the patient is located in order for Medicare to cover those services. One of the first fle telehealth flexibilities that Medicare came out with was um, very early on, like in March of 2020, Medicare waived this requirement and said for Medicare payment purposes, we would pay for a telehealth service if the provider rendering the telehealth visit, the distant site professional, is not licensed in the state where the patient was located. That was a payment rule, but I think it was important to realize at the time that was not a licensing rule. That same service that Medicare might agree to pay for may still have constituted at the time the unauthorized practice of medicine in the state where the patient was located. So that created a little bit of confusion because the state public health declarations um, and, and executive orders from uh, the governors of each state the waivers allowing providers to deliver telehealth if they weren't licensed or the expedited licensing process um, for temporary telehealth licensing didn't often align perfectly with the date that Medicare um, said that they would pay for those services. So this is just kind of an outline on some topics to think about when um, the health, when the hospital, the healthcare facility uh, is contracting for the performance of telehealth services, whether that is with a telehealth group, you know, Teledocs Inc., or whether it's a KU health system that they're contracting with. In those agreements, um, we want to decide whether the originating site hospital is going to do its own medical staff application, approval, uh, membership, credentialing, and privileging for all of those distant site telehealth professionals, or if the originating site hospital wants to um, rely upon the distant site 
hospitals um, own medical staff application approval and credentialing and privileging, privileging process. That is an option and that's a flexibility that exists permanently. It's not just during the public health emergency, but we wanna see that specified um, in the agreement. So we kind of know whose responsibility is it. And we have right there in writing that proof that the originating site hospital has verified through relying on the distant site hospital um, that those professionals, anyone delivering telehealth is appropriately um, a member of the, the uh, medical staff and has the appropriate licenses, credentials, privileges, et cetera. Um, the due diligence when relying on another hospital screening process I think the, it, it would be uh, prudent of the originating site hospital to inquire what that process looks like. And that's not just um, you know, the submission of an application and verifying an active license in the state where the originating site hospital is located, but that may be things like um, looking at a state's Medicaid uh, sanction list or exclusion list. Um, it may be looking at um, uh, abuse, neglect, exploitation, mistreatment registries. It may be an OIG list of excluded individuals and entity search. So the originating site hospital uh, in that due diligence just wants to make sure that that the distant site hospital or the contracted telehealth groups screening process at least aligns with what the hospital would do or expect of their own internal providers. Um, insurance coverage, that may be something the originating site hospital wants to look into, the potential insurance implications if there is a miscommunication between distant site provider and originating site provider. Uh, that causes you know, harm or damage or, or um, um, a bad outcome at the originating site hospital, what are the insurance implications of that? Who's going to document those services and in what manner? You know, if the distant site professional uh, has orders or recommendations, will they have access to the originating site's medical record system to be able to input those orders directly? Um, or is that something that's going to get communicated in the form of an encounter note that the originating site providers then order on their own and make sure that those, um, those tests or other treatments um, are carried out according to the professional's orders? Um, when, at how quickly will those encounter reports get reported back? Is it electronic? Is it by fax? How does the originating site incorporate those notes um, into their electronic record keeping system? Who's going to do the billing? Uh, typically, what I see is that the originating site handles their own billing, the distant site hand handles their own billing, and that's how the, the different parties are paid. It's possible um, for the originating site to potentially do the professional billing. It requires additional documentation, submission of provider reassignment forms, possibly adding those professionals to the originating sites. Uh, health plan enrollment forms and some extra steps. Because of those extra steps, that's why I often don't see it uh, done that way. The other thing to consider where, you know, let's take um, a rural hospital in Kansas and a KU health system is that those entities likely have different payer contracts and network statuses. So outside of Medicare, there may be certain health plans that a patient participates in in Western Kansas that you know, urban metropolitan um, physician in Kansas City may not participate in. And that's an important consideration too because then the patient gets two bills, one as an in-network provider and one as an out-of-network provider. And that's always a, a challenging situation. Um, and just generally, there's a requirement under the Medicare rules that um, that these that, that the originating site, the telehealth professionals, that they're coordinating, they're meeting to review their services to make sure that patients are being taken care of in safe and effective manners. Now, here's where it starts to get really complicated for hospitals during the public health emergency. There is a concept um, called provider 
based statuses, provider-based billing that for, for hospitals, where um, we have hospital outpatient departments, you know, maybe that's your physical therapy department or other areas that are billed as and treated as outpatient departments of the hospital. Sometimes what looks like a provider office can be treated like a hospital outpatient department. It's called provider-based outpatient departments. And they bill and are paid like a hospital outpatient department. And the significance of that is instead of uh, just the professional provider billing for an office service and there's one bill, if it is a provider-based hospital outpatient department, there's two bills for every service. There's the facility fee, and then there's the professional fee um, for those same services. And during, at the beginning of the public health emergency, there were some interim rules that were published that allowed hospitals to create temporary expansion sites. And originally, the idea was those tents in the parking lot. You know, that's not typically an outpatient department of the hospital, but during the public health emergency, that could be treated like an outpatient department of the hospital, kind of a hospital without walls concept. And so patients that were seen um, in a drive through line in the tent in the parking lot could be billed as a patient of the hospital outpatient department. Adding on to that, Medicare also allowed in a very, I think, kind of strange way, patients' homes to be considered outpatient departments of the hospital. And this required a, um, a submission of a request to relocate a provider's outpatient department to certain patients' homes. And when that happened, when services are provided to a patient at home, and they're registered as a, an outpatient of the hospital, those services were billed as a hospital outpatient service and they were paid under the outpatient prospective payment system. Um, they still required a provider order, they still required supervision. Everything looked like a regular hospital outpatient department. It's just that the patient was not physically present on campus when those outpatient services were delivered. And sometimes those are delivered um, face to face. You know, someone, a, a clinical person may actually go to the patient's home to deliver that hospital outpatient service. But sometimes those outpatient services could be provided via telehealth as well. When that occurred, when there was a relocation request submitted to make the patient's home a provider-based outpatient department of the hospital, those services were reported by the hospital with a modifier PO, so like provider outpatient, or I don't know what it stands for. Um, and they are billed as if they were furnished on campus in a hospital outpatient department. But if those relocation processes were not followed, um, then a PN modifier is reported and they were paid at the physician fee schedule rate, not at the facility hospital outpatient prospective payment system rate. So this is an example that was given when these interim final rules came out that hospital clinical staff could remotely like via telehealth furnish psychotherapy services to a patient at home. And if the hospital submitted a relocation request to Medicare, making the patient's home and a relocated um, off campus outpatient department of the hospital, that psychotherapy service could be billed as a provider-based department of the, the hospital paid um, at the APC outpatient prospective payment system rate. So let me switch gears. I'm kind of checking my time here. Um, for professional billing of telehealth services provided to a patient in a facility setting, in a hospital setting. So one of the things we have to think about outside of the public health emergency is that um, the types of, of professionals who are designated as eligible to render distant health, distant telehealth services to serve as a distant site professional. 
What I think is interesting about, about this, and Robert, I think this is one of the things we might have pointed out in that presentation you were working on. Um, the Social Security Act does not set this definition of what disciplines and what licenses and credentials qualify as distance site professionals. It says physician or other practitioner. Medicare, through regulation, has defined what a practitioner means. And I think that's a good thing because our, our pre-COVID restrictions to physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, those on this list that exclude PTs, OTs, speech therapists, um, and, and, and certain other professionals, they could be added as permanent eligible distance site practitioners without a literal act of Congress to make that an option. That can be done through rulemaking much easier and much, much faster if CMS wanted to. It's interesting just to input um, the early history of the COVID pandemic and the changes in Medicare rules. One of the things that happened was almost daily for a while they were adding new professions. And then finally they said, if you can build Medicare, you can build telehealth during the emergency. And that was such a great day because I was so tired of going through the list to see, okay, what do they add now? What did they add? Um, and I hope that they'll see that some of these things really make sense to add permanently. You know, it does, the, the current COVID flexibility for any professional who's eligible to bill Medicare for those CPT codes can do it via telehealth makes a whole lot of sense. So I'll be really interested to see if that gets finalized as a permanent change after the public health emergency. And it's really also. interesting that that's how Missouri's telehealth parity law for in-state is. And boy, it's so much easier to understand how to do telehealth when you have such a simple rule as if you can do it in person, you can do it through telehealth. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's almost like the regulation hasn't really kept up with the evolution of telehealth and that now that we're significantly expanding the scope of telehealth services, if it's within your scope of practice to do face-to-face, -face, you're eligible to build telehealth or Medicare for that service face-to-face, -face, it doesn't make sense why they would be restricted in a, in a telehealth environment. So um, that's seeing that that is in a regulation and not the statute, I think is, um, is promising. Although back to the emerging telehealth legislation bills that we talked about a few weeks ago, I have seen several bills that in the Social Security Act would make permanent that any professional eligible to build Medicare is able to deliver telehealth and they some of the bills would actually write that into the statute so that CMS could not restrict it any further. It's interesting, sorry to keep interrupting because I know we don't have time, but that's exactly what happened in Missouri. I was in Missouri at the time and the legislature was got annoyed with the State Department of Health and Senior Services because they wanted it open and they felt like they kept writing regs that limited it. And so they they literally wrote the legislation so that the state couldn't write regs to contradict it. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I've seen it done a couple of ways in the bills that are proposed. One would put into the statute, any professional eligible to bill Medicare could provide a telehealth service on the telehealth list when all other telehealth requirements are met, it's in their scope of practice, you know, all of those things. Um, other bills simply said CMS can, can decide. Well, that's that that's already there. It didn't solve any problems because the Social Security Act is not the place where those restrictions currently lie. So there are um, for for professionals billing for services in the hospital setting. Many of the same rules for regular telehealth apply regardless of whether the patient's in an office or in a facility or, or where, where the patient is located. There are some unique kind of rules and caveats for patients in the facility setting for certain services. Um, stroke care is one of those. So several years ago, um, you know, similar to what we saw with or what we see under the Support Act, with telehealth for um, substance use disorder services. 
Medicare added a caveat that uh, telehealth services can be provided for the diagnosis, the evaluation, and the treatment of patients um, experiencing acute stroke or acute stroke symptoms and eliminated the geographic restrictions and the originating site restrictions for those services meaning the distant site professional could provide those services to a patient in Johnson County, Kansas, so no rural requirement, regardless of, of where the patient was located, if it was one of those eligible originating sites or um, if the patient was at home when the distant site professional was doing a telehealth service. That's permanent, that's, that's pre-COVID 2019, right before COVID hit, so that will continue to be in effect after COVID, even if we go back to geographic restrictions and if, if we um, go back to the patient's home not being an eligible originating site when the public health emergency ends. Um, for these hospitals, just like any other telehealth, serv telehealth service, can be an eligible originating site and bill their originating site fee. For both sides of, of this bill, the originating site fee from uh, whether it's a hospital or other location, and the distant site professional, they report a G0 modifier on both of their claims when the telehealth service was specific to the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of acute stroke. Well, I have, uh, there, are, there are not diagnosis code restrictions or requirements on those claims. Um, I think it's reasonable to, to expect and to look for uh, an acute stroke type ICD-10 CM diagnosis code to go on those claims um, to support that it falls under this coverage criteria. There are a couple, um, uh, generally outside of the public health emergency, these would be reported with place of service 02, effective January 1st if the patient were at home when this telehealth service for acute stroke symptoms were, was provided, we may be required to report place of service 10 for that telehealth service. Um, critical access hospitals can report these as well. So critical care provided via telehealth is a really um, interesting evolving area that I expect we're going to see some significant changes here in about two weeks when the the physician fee schedule final rule comes out. So currently critical care um, via telehealth is temporarily added to the list of covered telehealth services. So 992919292 critical care for the first hour and each additional 30 minutes within a calendar day would um, end the end of the calendar year when the public health emergency ends. That asterisk there is that if the final rules, uh, when the final rule comes out, that possibly would extend all the way through December 31st, 2023. I anticipate it probably would. Um, and then the, the proposed rule that would go into effect January 1st has some significant changes to um, critical care coding and billing because they are, these are time-based codes. Um, there are some new rules that would dictate who gets to bill for them, um, how we count time to support which codes and how many add-on codes we get to report for these services. So without re revisiting all of those pre uh, proposals now, we'll, we'll touch on them again when the final rule comes out and we have our session in November, just be aware that critical care via telehealth is likely going to have some significant changes uh, that are announced here in the next couple of weeks. But interestingly, it's not just those two CPT codes that are available as telehealth for critical care or inpatient consultation type services. Um, in addition to 99291 and 99292, there's also critical care consult codes. So we may have the patients like hospitalist or attending physician doing critical care via telehealth um, in person, 992, or I'm sorry, I said telehealth, critical care in person, 99291. And we may have a specialist like a neurologist providing a critical care consult via telehealth. And those have an option to be billed separately with G05 um, 
08 or 09, depending on, on the time. We also have back in 2000, I want to say eight or nine, there used to be inpatient consultation codes that were eliminated from the CPT code book. But at the same time, Medicare still wanted to be able to pay for inpatient telehealth consultations. And so G040, 6, 7, and 8 were created around that same time to replace what used to be CPT codes for um, inpatient consults. These are specific to telehealth. Um, they're time-based 15, 25, or 35 minutes of inpatient consults. And um, I wanted to clarify here too that by inpatient, that means inpatient in, in like an acute care hospital setting, but it can also be the skilled nursing facility setting. It's not limited to hospital patients. And then we have, um, so, or, um, Four, uh, four, two, five, six, and seven are the initial consults. Six, seven, and eight are the follow-up telehealth consultations by that same provider. A few of these, the critical care consults 291, 292, critical care telehealth consult 508, 509, those are not eligible to be provided as audio only services right now where we currently have a flexibility to deliver certain telehealth services as audio only, where the others in the middle could be delivered as an audio only service um, during the public health emergency. I know we're out of time, so I'm going to include this slide that came from our session on the Medicare proposed rule for critical care, and I'll make sure I'll address that whatever provisions are finalized when we have our session here in a couple weeks on the new, um, the new telehealth critical care rules that will go into effect January 1. And then just as a reminder, during the public health emergency, supervision can be provided virtually through virtual presence. So when a provider normally has to be in the office suite immediately available or on the floor uh, um, when, the, when care is being provided to a patient to meet supervision requirements, during the public health emergency, that physical presence requirement has been expanded to allow virtual presence. So the provider is able to intervene and, and provide assistance virtually through audiovisual technologies. And we, I kind of expect that temporary flexibility to potentially be finalized on a permanent basis so that anytime a telehealth service is provided, and the supervision requirements would be met if the provider is available through virtual presence audiovisual technology. Okay, I know I went a, a minute over there, but a lot of, lot of information on facility billing. And like I said, we'll, we, we have even more coming out here in the next couple of weeks that we'll certainly share with you as soon as that information becomes available. Well, and I know the midst our breaking news. Really pleased that we're up to the minute information on what's going on. Um, I did put in the chat, but we'll also um, the November and December sessions, including the session on November 17th um, on the finalized fee schedule, which I know everybody's going to want to attend as well as the others. And also just so you know, we are hoping to continue into the new year. We've had a strong interest in this, these sessions and we'll continue. We're really excited to be able to offer this level of detail and um, you know, Rochelle's information is always so useful to anyone trying and working on telehealth. And um, we're aware that being having solid knowledge and feeling secure about what you can do and how to do telehealth is probably the biggest thing that can help make your telehealth practice be successful. So I hope everybody has a great day. Uh, we'll see you for our next session on uh, November 10th and uh, continue to see you and appreciate everybody's participation. Please feel free to send your questions to HCRC. Um, to the HCRC email address or go on our website. Um, and we're always happy to answer those outside of the sessions or to clarify. Um, and Rochelle's always available for those types of questions. So, and I think there were some in the chat that I didn't get to. Um, I'll, I've copied the, the chat and I'll make sure I get to those questions to send them out afterwards. And we'll send out the information um, to any questions to the entire group. And uh, please follow up with any other questions you have. So, have a great day.